Welcome to Wrestling at Random. I'm Jeremy Deemer. And I am Adam Summers. And you are in Season 4 of Wrestling at Random. And somehow, you may find this hard to believe, but four seasons into this podcast, there are still promotions or territories that we have not yet reviewed here on the free feed of this podcast. And this week is one of those. And Jeremy, it's one that I think, unless people listen very closely to this show, they may may be surprised to find out that this one is very much in your wheelhouse. It is it is surprising. Uh, we are talking about CMLL. This is the uh, Lucha Libre promotion in Mexico. Uh, there's two big promotions. There's CMLL and there's AAA. Uh, I got big into watching the weekly program. It was uh, they had this Lucha block in like ninety nine two thousand uh, on Galavision, where they'd have like a Lucha block. They do. Uh, the CMLL show for an hour and a half, and then they'd have an hour and a half of the uh, AAA show. And the, and I tried to watch them both, and I did not care for AAA in the slightest. So I would watch the CMLL block, enjoy it highly, gave me new depth to the Wrestling Observer Mexico sections. And uh, and, and so I, I, I definitely highly enjoyed. This was like, and you know, this was a one of the boom periods here uh going into uh you know there's a lot of ebbs and flows i'll talk about it uh, through here but there was a lot of top talent uh they were they had a lot of old guys on top but a lot of the younger guys on the in the mid card making their way to the to the main events were were pretty special guys and so it was really exciting to watch and it was just something different you wanted an alternative from the wwe at that time uh, wcw was trash uh and it was it was just a a hard watch and you wanted something else this was the something else that i could easily get in a weekly television show and uh i there was nothing more disheartening than when sometimes it wasn't on and it was just a three-hour triple a block like you'd fire (laughs) it oh oh my tivo said it and and all i got was triple a that reminds me of of back in the day around the same time period i guess maybe a year or two prior uh, when ECW is on WJYS, Channel 62 in Chicago at what was it, three in the morning or one in the morning, <laughs> whatever it was, like I think Friday night to Saturday morning. And I always set my VCR and I'd be so mad when either ECW didn't send them that week's tape or they just screwed up and didn't play the right tape and ended up having a repeat episode. Always super frustrating, so I feel your pain there with CML, CMLL, which, by the way, is, if I'm not mistaken, I always hear this on New Japan broadcast when they talk about CMLL, the longest continually running promotion in the world at this point. It's the oldest, still viable, depending on your, your description of viable as we record this uh, uh, promotion in the world. You are absolutely correct, sir. Uh, the promotion started as EMLL back in 1933 is when it was founded. Uh, it eventually was renamed CMLL after they split with the NWA. Uh, it is th- This company is pro wrestling's oldest promotion. Uh, Antonio Pena left CMLL in 1992. He's the one who left to form the rival company AAA. Uh, CMLL was actually losing popularity to AAA with its more modern style in the 90s. But CMLL always had a business that couldn't lose money the way it was structured. They paid wrestlers on a percentage of the house. They owned the majority of their arenas, meaning that they got not just ticket revenue, but concessions and parking revenue. And they never paid any rent. Uh, they also made money renting out their venue to other shows. There would always be like the circus was coming uh, and, and they would rent it out there. They also made money brokering their talent to other promotions around Mexico. When business was strong, wrestlers were very well paid by the standard of the time. And when business was weak, the company didn't lose money and the wrestlers weren't, they just weren't paid well. <laughs> so from 88 to 91, again from 2005 to 2008, CMLL's Friday night shows at Arena Mexico did as good a run as any promotion has ever had in one city in the history of wrestling. They they always have strong tourism business. There's no arena in the world 
that has drawn half as many people to pro wrestling as Arena Mexico does every year, as they do steadily anywhere from 5,500 fans to 16,000 fans each Friday night in the exact same building. It's insane. It's you hear you know other territories talk about. You hear Lawler talk about Memphis. You know and how they'd run. You know every Monday night and how you had to bring people back. You had to do different things. You know they've had their ebbs and flows, but it is unbelievable that they've had even even at the low end drawing 5,500 a week every Friday night in the same major city would be impressive. Uh, also, just wanted to note that if you are uh, a Wrestling Observer newsletter reader or an Observer radio listener with Dave Meltzer, you will never hear him other than in the heading refer to them as CMLL. Whenever you hear him say Arena Mexico, that's him talking about not just the shows that happen in the arena, but the promotion CMLL. Absolutely correct. And uh, this show here, we'll see uh, a lot of Arena Mexico, but we'll also see some uh, Arena Coliseo as well. Yes, so. the opening matches from Arena Coliseo, I believe. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because uh, uh, I know no Spanish, so I'm gonna I'm gonna preface this right now. I know zero Spanish words, so my only Spanish that I know is from osmosis, from watching <laughs> CMLL broadcast. That's so, how I was with Japanese, <laughs> watching <laughs> watching Japanese wrestling for so long. That's uh, I'll I'll try to help, I guess, then with my two years of seventh and eighth grade spanish which i don't you think will get me much further than than your osmosis cmll <laughs> tv watching yeah. spanish will yeah that literally i never t took a a minute of spanish in uh in high school or college uh i i did take one semester of japanese in college but that's there a you know, that's another story so uh the 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 thing that, that you note right away when watching a CMLL show, we'll, we'll preface this. Uh, you can find this as of the, this recording on, on YouTube. It's uh, CMLL's television from October 28th, 2005. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is, man, is that ring hard. Oh. <laughs> this is like old boxing ring hard. Yeah, this is like the WWF rings of the you know 80s into the 90s basically until Vince McMahon had to wrestle a match and said oh my god those rings are so hard let's make them softer those rings look like trampolines compared to this ring here and it's what influenced the lucha style a lot where guys you know when they take an arm drag or whatever they roll through everything they roll yeah. through a lot of stuff they don't take a lot of you know a lot of bumps <laughs> on that and that's because of this the the ring uh, helping to influence that style well, it's fascinating too because that the ring, the environment, the surroundings are what created a big part of the in-ring style. But then now that's that style is filtered out all over the world to all different promotions, many of which don't have these rock hard rings, but you still see guys trained in that style uh, and rolling through a lot of moves in that same way. And it's crazy the longevity that these guys have. Oh. We'll get to it. Like some of these guys like wrestle into their 60s with ease. And it's like they they get terrible because this is a tough style to do when you're old. But they're still stars and they still are able to uh, they still remain on top long past their expiration dates for sure. Um, this this show opens with some commercials. We'll touch on commercials throughout the show. Uh, the. <laughs> first commercial i wanted to know was someone was convincing their date to go to the track and bet on horses uh, <laughs> i couldn't follow along again no spanish so i was just trying to follow yeah. along here a lot of these commercials were very similar to the commercials we've seen uh and in some ways kind of strikingly similar to the 80s commercials we saw yes. on some of the territory shows that we've five is the year of this program in 2005 here uh, but then there's some like this one that clearly are very different and hard to really get your head around. Yeah, I mean, we saw there was a commercial for like a 900 number to get psychic readings, and yes. like, that type of commercial yes. was everywhere in the 90s. Like, yes, uh, but we we see we cut to the actual show. We see folks uh, talking about setting up Arena Mexico. We see clips of the production, some backstage stuff, some like kind of what goes you know talking to the the uh, some of the the, the managers and the leadership as well as uh, the production folks that put on the show pretty pretty cool looking uh, stuff from behind the scenes 
Yeah, we get a few of these little segments before matches and really cool, something different, you know, didn't expect. One of the things that's most noteworthy is when you see the wrestlers backstage, you really get a sense of just how old these buildings are. Like, there are no amenities. No, no. Uh, we open the show at Arena Coliseo, where our first match is the Rudos team. <laughs> these are your... Uh, your bad guys, your your heels, the Rudos, the team of Locomax, Hooligan, and Archangel taking on your Technicos, your good guys, your baby faces, uh, Tigre, Metallico, Pantera, and Tony Rivera. I was very disappointed that Hooligan did not look like I would expect a Hooligan to look. The other thing I noted right away is, oh my God, it's Pantera. I remember yes. him wrestling Takama Shinoku. I believe on a previous episode of this podcast, you are with correct. Brian Christopher and Jerry Lawler on insufferable commentary, uh, but he is here in 2005. I will have thoughts, particularly on. He didn't Tony look like Rev he could compete in the light heavyweight division oh. any longer. <laughs> no, no. It is funny though how you talk about older wrestlers and how much it always is beneficial if you want to continue your career you know, deep into your 40s, into your 50s, even into your 60s, if you are a masked wrestler, and even more, if you are a masked wrestler with full body suit, you can last a lot longer. Uh, like I said, we'll talk about all the wrestlers throughout this match, but the one guy I just want to mention right off the top that I was insanely impressed by and have no recollection of ever really seeing before, Tony Rivera. This dude yeah. was awesome here. In a lot of ways, he reminded me of... A, a luchador that I'm much more familiar with for his, from his many years in pro wrestling, Noah. I got big Ricky Marvin vibes here uh, from Tony Rivera. That's a great comp. Uh, and yeah, and and this is, you know, with opening match Lucha, which really isn't much of a showcase. Uh, they, they really, exactly. uh, it's really basic and patterned a lot of opening match stuff here and that we should mention all these are three fall best of three fall matches by the way as well i believe well you are or, correct yes 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 this these are all best of three falls except for the wacky eliminator tournament that we'll get to later yes, the torneo uh, cybernetico i believe it is yeah this is uh so uh the first fall premier kaida uh lots of air horns and <laughs> oh my god these air horns you talk about like Having I needed this match just to acclimate myself to how much air horn there was going to be. I don't know if I have like, and I say this in all seriousness, I don't know if I have undiagnosed sensory issues around this. I could not focus on this match at all. I had to take my earbuds out and just watch this match without sound. I couldn't, I could not handle it. It's it's in Arena Mexico, it's different because it's not just the air horns. They everyone has like crazy noisemakers. They yes. got the things that spin around there's and they more say, variety. 100% the Rudos. Sounds. Yeah, there's more variety here in the tinier building. It's all air horns that's overpowering everything. Uh, match opens with three straight lucha stalemates. Then we get uh, stereo top rope drop kicks from uh, Tigre Metallico and Tony Rivera, followed by stereo tope suicidas to the outside. Pantera. Tries to roll up Loco Max, but he sits down on it, and Loco Max steals a pin on Pantera for the first fall. Yes, that stuffed victory roll—the uh, best way to describe it, other than it sounding like a sandwich you'd get at Panera. Um, it is uh, basically the Owen Brett, Owen Brett finish, finish from yeah. WrestleMania 10 we see here uh, executed. Um, the the other note that I have just a fashion corner on the ring—it's got the big Corona Extra advertisement Always. on the ring which i recall from years before on the ring for triple a in the when worlds collide show in 1994 which i think is a lot of people probably of our age as well in, in our early 40s a lot of people's initial exposure to lucha was that show and we will actually see uh another guy a guy that actually wrestled on that show we will see later on on this show as well lots of commercials here for creams and bandages <laughs> Yes, and lots then, of ointments. I'm assuming lots this of might, ointments and creams. This might have been a business to business play. They may have been advertising this directly to the wrestlers who are going back <laughs> and watching their matches after in, wrestling and taking bumps in that hard ring. We get a clip of CMLL's version of the Nitro Girls dancing, and then we're back for Segunda Caída, our second fall. 
Loco Max, he's pulling on the mask of uh, Tigre Metallico as the Rudos triple team him. Pantera knocked to the outside. Archangel with a plancha to the floor. Tigre, he jumps backward off the middle rope, hitting Hooligan with a headbutt, and then hooks the guy's arms, does a wacky roll-up, and gets the pin for the second fall. Yeah, very quick second fall. I love that second rope sort of springing back uh, headbutt, almost like a back headbutt version of the coffin splash uh, rather than the coffin drop that uh, Darby Allen uses. One of those things that I'd love to see more wrestlers use. But yeah, quick second fall. Uh, we are even up at one as we are in most best of three fall Lucha matches, it feels like, that I've seen. Uh, and yeah, we start with Archangel and Pantera going at it. A great satellite arm drag and tilt-a-roll backbreaker uh, from Pantera. You have to have at least one tilt-a-roll backbreaker in a Lucha match, and they reach the quota here. Always, yeah. Uh, Tercera, Kaeda, our third fall. You've got, uh, we got a quick switch. Tigre hits a flying head scissors on Loco Max. He rolls to the floor. Tigre arm drags him on the floor, which looked brutal. Yeah. Uh, Tony Rivera's in with Hooligan. And here's where he, he climbs to the top and hits a Rana. And Hooligan rolls to the floor. Rivera comes off the top with a cross body to the floor, landing at the feet of the first row. There are no guardrails in no. Arena Mexico or here. You just no. land into the into the feet of the people. Literally and figuratively, no guardrails here. Uh, a great dive, like you said, that top rope crossbody, the plancha off the top, out of the corner from Rivera. Everything he did in this sequence just looked beautiful. That second rope uh, Rana that you talked about, um, he did a beautiful like rope walk up into a crossbody in the ring before the plancha to the floor so yeah i want to see more of tony rivera loco max with a somersault dive over the top to the floor t gray with a drop kick off the apron to the floor takes out loco max this Arch was this drop kick was kind of weird it was a bit improvised i have a feeling he was maybe going for something else and had to switch midstream it landed but it looked it looked strange particularly given how on point everything else was in this dive sequence that's right. The dive sequence continues with Archangel as he does a giant cross body off the top to the floor onto Tigre. There's bodies everywhere outside at this point. Pantera joins them with a somersault dive over the top to the floor. He heard you. He traveled back in time and heard you saying he may no longer be eligible for the light heavyweight division. <laughs> and he said, uh, maybe he's not for the light, the light heavyweight division, but maybe for the X division where there's no limits. Back inside. Archangel tries to powerbomb Pantera, but Pantera slips behind him, rolls him in a sunset flip, gets the three count, Technicos with the victory in the opener. Yeah, I feel like that move, which we saw as the finish here, that sort of spin up into where it looks like you're going to be powerbomb, but instead you roll all the way over and hit a sunset flip. That's one of the moves of this show. We see it multiple times. I don't mind because to me, it's one of the most simple but beautiful moves in wrestling. Uh, but it gets the finish here, uh, as you said. We see some guys backstage at Arena Mexico walking around, including Damien Seis. And then uh, we get more of the women wearing bikinis and boots, and then more production clips like we open the show with. Yeah, Damien, we should mention a guy who was here in 2005, saw him on Nitro back in the mid to late mm -hmm. 90s in WCW. And I just went to a show a couple years ago for MLW that Damien was on. So as you said, these guys somehow last. This match is from Arena Mexico. And we get one of my favorite ring announcers. Like there's Howard Finkel. There's Gary Michael Capetta. There's the New Japan ring announcer. And there's the CMLL ring announcer. This guy <laughs> is phenomenal. He's one of my favorites. And I had forgotten about him. I, he's he's on that Mount Rushmore of ring announcers, and I forgot about him until I heard his dulcet tones here. I love it. Let's hear him make these introductions. En un encuentro de relevos australianos, lucharán de dos a tres caídas sin límite.
Gracias Mauricio Medina, señoras y señores, bienvenidos a la México Catedral, en una emisión más a todo el planeta Tierra, esta es la sección Bosque de Piernas, que siempre presentamos para beneplácito de todos los caballeros. We're told about the captains, so obviously you heard him introduce the captains of the team. Uh, there's, there's no rhyme or like they, I, it took me a while when I was watching Lucha to figure out. I'm like, well, what does it mean? Do you have to beat the captain to win the fall? Do you have to? If you beat the captain, do you, what does that mean? Uh, nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, yeah, because there's just, other there's other captains fall rules, um, whether it be six man, eight man, ten man tag matches, where basically you either have to eliminate all the other guys. In, on the team or if you pin the captain then you win without having to eliminate anyone else but that apparently is not the case here in cmlo not not the case uh so ghetto from japan is the captain of the rudos team yes i was so excited to see ghetto here this is at the height of him as a tag team wrestler uh, at this point in New Japan Pro Wrestling with Jado, uh, the perennial junior tag team champions around this time period. Such a great heel and a really underrated wrestler at this point. So it's Gato. It's Hajime Ohara, who if you're a viewer, if you're a Wrestle Universe subscriber in modern times and you're a Pro Wrestling Noah viewer, you would recognize that name as one of the top junior heavyweights in Pro Wrestling Noah uh, in modern times. And then the third member of the team is Okamura, who, if you watch New Japan Fantastica Mania shows every year, he's the one Japanese guy who you probably don't recognize. He has been in Mexico for almost 20 years. He was in All Japan, wow. left All Japan in 2004, went to Mexico on uh, an excursion, and just never came back, basically, other than for the occasional shows for Fantastica Mania, whatever. He's completely uh, embedded in cmll in mexico a lot of times when guys get sent over he's kind of the guy the guys get sent over from new japan i should say uh, he's the guy that they work with first and it's funny because 20 years later for better or worse he physically looks exactly the same and moves exactly the same as he did here in 2004 he's one of those wrestlers that was like born an old man and just kind of grew into it their opponents heavy metal is the Technico captain, Heavy Metal's partner, Felino, and Maximo. Fili or, uh, heavy Metal, this is the same Heavy Metal that was on World's When Worlds Collide yes. in 1994, correct? I thought you so. You are correct. This is the same Heavy Metal. He would go between AAA and CMLL, and he was just he was everywhere all the time and pretty popular for, for quite he a while. He looked pretty good here for being 11 years later. I know he was a, he was a young guy back in 94, but he looked decent here. Premiera Kaeda, our first fall. We have heavy metal being popular, like I mentioned. <laughs> we have Gato being a heel, like I mentioned. He is in his element here with this crowd that just hates him. That's 100% what he wants out of his life is to be hated. Uh, he bows to the ramp and is jawing with the fans. And it's, it, it's in a setting like this where you really realize, on top of like, yeah, he was a very solid in-ring wrestler. His character is just a 100% amalgamation of every American style heel that he grew up watching through tape trading. Like he's every single one of those territory guys rolled into one. We get a handspring bouncing off the ropes, then hitting a back elbow to Gato. Heavy Metal puts on an abdominal stretch while Felino and Maximo take out Akamura and Ohara. The ref counts all the pins, and Team Mexico is up one fall to zero. We see the replay, and we get a good look that uh, Metal also kicked Ghetto in the face before putting on the abdominal stretch. I had missed that until I saw yes. the replay. Well, these replays, as painstaking as there are, there's like a couple minutes, it feels like, between falls, and we get slow motion replays of the finish from every angle they have. And at first blush, that might sound like it's going overboard uh, from a production standpoint, but almost every time, the initial camera shot you see is just a blur and it's hard to tell who yeah. pinned who, why it happened. Um, and so you need, it almost felt to me like they purposely do that to make the replays something you need to watch. You, you did. So I missed that kick. I needed to see that. Then Maximo 
when he uh, he went for the pin off a hip attack yes. off the middle rope, which I did not see. No, we didn't see the, the, <laughs> that second rope hip attack at all. No. Uh, as a, it's, we get four angles of the finish, and it took that many to understand what occurred. Yeah, and uh, Fileno pinned Akamura with a crucifix. As we go to Segunda Caído. Fileno and Maximo with the early advantage. Uh, Gato's in with heavy metal again, and the air horns are 100% behind heavy metal right here. Yes. Uh, the Japanese attack heavy metal. We get a quick double team, and then they knock Fileno and Max Maximo off the apron. A triple team on heavy metal. Maximo comes in. He gets triple teamed. Then it's Fileno's turn to get triple teamed. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of this throughout these, these trios matches where – uh, I, I know, like, if you're familiar with Lucha, even in a passing way, you know, you know, like, you don't have to tag. You just come in when the guy goes to the floor. But there is zero attempt made in any of these matches for them to stay as straight tags. There are long, long stretches where the heels will be in control and it's they'll triple team one guy. That guy gets knocked out to the floor. The next side comes in and he'll just get triple teamed for a minute. The next side comes in and he'll get triple teamed. It's a different, interesting way if you're familiar with mostly with, with American style or Japanese style wrestling uh, to have long heat segments where it's on different guys throughout. Yeah, no, this, the, the psychology is completely different with uh, just, it, it, and that's, it, it's the, the, the entire fall is a heat uh, <laughs> segment yeah. for, for a match here. Um, Heavy Metal gets back in. He gets beat down. We get a double drop toe hold and O'Hara with a sliding drop kick. Hara puts on a submission while Akamura puts the boots to him and we get a submission and we're even at one fall apiece. I love that this submission counts. We've got uh, O'Hara, like you said, it's almost like a grounded abdominal stretch, like a ground cobra. And Gato and Okamura are putting the boots to him and the ref doesn't try to stop this. And no, he's he like, it. do you quit? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it is, it's, it's 100% legal, not even with like a five count or anything. It is 100% legal for it to be three on one, even in a submission hold. So one of the many differences you have to wrap your mind around if you're delving into a, a CMLL show for the first time. The third fall team Japan picks up right where they left, left off and they're triple teaming Maximo, then Felino. heavy metal fights back. A big punch to Akamura, running clothesline in the corner on Ohara. Maximo with a chop, and the place goes wild. <laughs> I'm like, <Yes>. okay. <laughs> they were ready for him to get some offense, apparently. Ohara and Metal are in. Metal hip tosses him over the top rope to the floor. Heavy Metal gets knocked to the outside from behind. In the ring, Akamura hits an inverted DDT on Maximo. Then we get a flatliner by Gato on Felino. Gato goes to the top, hits a frog splash on Felino for the pin. Team Japan are your winners. Two straight yes. falls at the end. Gato getting the win, getting the direct pinfall win in the third fall. Uh, only thing I was disappointed about was he didn't yell super fly like he would in Japan before he hit the uh, the big super fly snook and top rope splash here. Uh, but this was fun. Again, it's... <laughs> It's hard. Lucha is so strange in that it's the most instantly accessible thing for non-wrestling fans to watch and be like, oh, that's fun. But if you're a wrestling fan who's steeped in American-style wrestling or even Japanese-style wrestling, it is the hardest thing to wrap your mind around and get yourself centered in the place you need to be to watch a match like this and enjoy it and not just think it's a mess. Like you have to understand that's what this style is. You have to leave your preconceived notions at the door and just watch. And that can be difficult. What's also accessible is there's only like two or three angles going on at a time. Like not every match has an angle. Yes. Uh, it, it, everything on the lower card is two out of three fall six man matches. And, uh, but there are, you know, there's upper mid guard and, and main event stories and even as someone who doesn't speak a lick of Spanish, you can drop in and you can figure out what's going on in a story just by the story they're telling in the ring, just yeah. by the, the 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 backstage 
lucha skits that they do are uh they're they're easy to to tell just by body language you can figure out what's going on and like it's uh it, it is pretty easily accessible even though there's a, a a strong language barrier yeah and that what you said to me is very refreshing in that sometimes when you're watching a wrestling company where like every single match has a story attached and every single wrestler is in a feud or story or angle in one sense that's great because it keeps people from uh you know just getting caught in the middle and really you don't know what's going on with them but it can be kind of exhausting as a viewer just having all that in your head like sometimes you just want to watch three or four matches of just dudes having a match so that then when the stuff that you're supposed to care about happens you really care about it and you're not emotionally worn out yeah, my favorite comp, uh, I think uh, the guys at Wrestling Brain made this comp once, and I, I it sticks with me every time, is uh, uh, it's like a good regular season matchup in a sport. Yeah. Right? Like sometimes you get like, uh, you know, sometimes you'd get that Ovi versus Sid, uh, Penguins and, and Capitals on a Wednesday night, right? And it's just like, hey, great matchup when they're at the top of their, their game, right? Like that, you get a good regular season matchup, and you get excited about it. It's like, oh, this is just two great guys having a great match. And and that's what a lot of these undercard matches are that don't have a, a storyline. Yeah. And some of the undercard matches feel like a random Tuesday night Columbus Blue Jackets, Phoenix yep. Coyotes game. And that's fine, too, because then the other the, the good stuff stands out. If not, everything is blow away. Great. We see a graphic for El Hio del Santo saying uh that uh the first playoff tournament the silver legend uh is what the screen says so uh his he, there's a there's gonna be a tournament uh for his 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 father's uh a trophy with his father's mask on it here uh silver legend we'll see that later on um more commercials for pills this time acne pills uh we get more creams and moisturizers and then we see a man in a suit this man in a suit <laughs> is standing there and then the camera zooms in on his ass and then all of a sudden we see a doctor standing in hell and yes this is a hemorrhoid commercial <laughs> i mean really it's the universal language of describing what it's like to have hemorrhoids like i i understood exactly what they're doing and i also like the storytelling of <laughs> the progression of commercials in this break you've got the acne cream then you've got all the other creams and ointments. <laughs> and then you've got the commercial of someone's ass in hell because they have hemorrhoids. I feel like they're telling us something here. Uh, amazing top tier commercial break. So we get a stellar moments highlight package from the week. And uh, we see a dude named Bam Bam jump off the ramp to the to the ringside area he jumps over a couple of rows of fans to wipe out his opponent this dive was awesome they made a massive mistake by making this the first stellar moment that we yes. would see because my expectations were through the roof after seeing this dive it looked like the lucia ramp equivalent of that new jack dive that was in the ecw open yes. for so long where he's like flying through the air and his arms are waving around that's what this looks like and then after that we just see like a power slam hey hey uh, it's not just a power slam that's dr wagner jr power slamming atlantis on the ramp and yeah it was pretty cool but i just I saw love, something at the ramp even better i love dr wagner jr oh yeah and uh one of the coolest things about dr wagner jr he used to come out to bon jovi's bad medicine as a theme song loved it Dr. one of the Wagner. best uh combinations of <laughs> wrestler and theme music i remember him in new japan uh in the 90s uh, early 2000s coming out to that as well uh, we then see a, a a clip of a crazy double backflip spot by mystico and mr aguila who uh was sa rios as well in the wwf this is just a cavalcade of short-lived light heavyweight champions in the WWF here on this show. Uh, but this crazy double backflip spot straight into a La Mystica from oh, Mystico on to uh, Mr. Aguila for the submission win. I forgot how awesome Mystico is until seeing La Mystica again. I'm like, I 
lo- that finish is, is oh, so it's spectacular. And he's so good. And it's crazy how he went to WWE and they just broke him. <laughs> well, yeah, because he went there as a massive star. as a guy who had revitalized the business in Mexico and had created a boom period almost yeah. single-handedly. Obviously, he had rivals that, that elevated things as well. He was he wrestler goes, of the year in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, the first yeah. uh, uh, luchador to win that. Goes to WWE and rightfully thinks of himself and carries himself as a star because, A, he is one and B, that's what he's always taught to do. He gets to WWE, and that's the worst thing you could do there is be a star from somewhere else, and they just, like they've done with so many other guys, just beat it out of him. Ugh. And, uh, yeah, so now we... Uh... Uh, we see the plaque. We go back to the ring. We see the the cool plaque. They're holding it up with the Santo mask on it. Uh, I have no clue what the rules are uh, or what's about to happen here. So uh, we'll figure it out as we go along. But we're we get a graphic for Group A, where we get uh, La Mascara, Mysterioso, Averno, and Negro Casas. Negro Casas, I am so excited. Uh, when I see this on the screen that we are going to get to see Negro Casas because my recollections of him every time I saw him was that he was incredible. He's it awesome. didn't matter how old he was, even in his in his 60s, he appeared uh, in, in 2022 on an episode of New Japan Strong Wrestling in the Ring. And speaking of New Japan Strong, I was shocked to see Mysterioso, who we see on an almost weekly basis on the New Japan Strong television show, was in CMLL in 2005? What? Group B, El Hio Del Santo, Volador Jr., another person we see a lot of in uh, Japan. Uh, we get Giotto, <laughs> the other yes. half of Giotto and Gato. Giotto, who we should mention, by the way, jacked to the gills. Very he much so. Is, he is huge here. And then Ombre Sinombre. As, uh, Ombre Sinombre, which is the, like, it, it feels like the Mr. X of Lucha. <laughs> it's just a man with no name. I, at first, I thought it might be Brutus Beefcake. <laughs> Do you remember between when he was the butcher and all these other things? Oh. He had a brief run in WCW as the man with no name. <laughs> Volador and Averno were awesome together to start this match. Yes. Uh, we see Santo doing a tope suicida through the corner. I love his his tope where instead of going like in the mid part of between the second and third ropes, he runs toward the corner and hits that. Very cool. Yeah, and we talk about guys that do tope suicidas like this, and uh, Santo is so cool. Not only like doing it through the corner like that, but every time he does a tope it's with a ton of speed and a ton of force yes. like this like darby it's not allen's a john moxley a guy, tope no like D- darby allen's a guy who does with he does a ton of speed a ton of force and it feels reckless uh here it's like it, it's graceful but with a ton of speed and a ton of force I you know who it actually Moxley. reminds me of who, who the guy who i think has show in show out in modern times the best suicide dive the best tope suicida bushy it's very similar in that it's a ton of speed his feet never hook on the middle rope as he goes through it's always clean but it look but he lands it it's not just like he puts his hands out and barely touches the guy uh el hijo dos santos one of those guys also that i whenever i see him i'm always surprised by how athletic he is because he just doesn't have that athletic look particularly this deep into his career Got a little bit of that that beer belly going on, and he just doesn't. You know, matter. There's, it doesn't matter. He still he still executes all the dives with with the same speed and precision that you know that you would expect of guys younger and in better shape than him. Giotto gets in there, and this man does zero lucha, and no. I loved it. <laughs> no, no, he yeah, even less than Gato, who is capable of doing some being a base. Uh, Giotto doesn't have an interest in being a ba- you know being a no. base for anybody. It's chops, it's forearms, it's poses, and yeah. then it's chops, and then it's forearms. Yeah, cracked me up. Uh, guys were in and out here. It was hard to keep up with. Well, we... to the point that I was trying to figure out if that was the rule that like you did a couple moves and then you had to go to the floor 
and then someone else came, knocked someone else to the floor because it felt like the first five or six minutes of it was two guys in, they'd go for hard for about 30 seconds, someone would get knocked to the floor, someone would come in. Like this, this progression kept going at sort of the same intervals uh, for quite a bit of this first fall. For not the first fall, but of this this first stretch of the match. Yeah, we, we start to figure out the rules here as uh, we see Ombre Sinombre eliminated by submission. Uh, he was eliminated by La Mascara. And uh, so it's like, okay, so if you get pinned or submit, you're out and the match continues. So it's Group A versus Group B. So it's basically a Survivor Series match. It's a Survivor Series With match. With lucha rules. And... and uh, Giotto eliminates La Mascara with a crossface. La Mascara is getting stretchered out. I don't know what happened here, but they had to bring out a board and everything for this guy. Yeah, a few times we have that, and it's a great thing, too, where you don't have a full stretcher. It's just a plastic board, and you just carry the guys out sort of unceremoniously. Hopefully everyone was legitimately okay, because we've certainly seen that in very, very dire, tragic situations with the backboard. Um, but yeah, that uh, I was taken aback because it didn't. We didn't see what happened here, and we no. didn't get a replay. I guess because this wasn't the end of a fall. Santo eliminates Mysterioso, and at this point, I'm like, Santo's got to win this trophy. It's named yeah. after his father. He's got to win this trophy. Uh, Negro Casas with a surprise roll up on Jado eliminates him. I want to just quickly back to, go back to the Santo fall because it was the second of many times we saw, as I mentioned earlier, that flip up into almost a powerbomb position, but then a rolling through to go over your opponent's head and land the sunset flip. We see that quite a bit. Everybody was Billy Kidman back then. Yes. <laughs> yes. Santo with a top rope, belly-to-belly -belly suplex, kills oh Averno. This was brutal, brutal, and Averno is injured here, and he has to be stretched to the back. And this looked legit. This was terrifying. This is why you, him. this is why you do the Spanish fly rather than the top rope belly to belly suplex. This was just full force impact sternum on sternum, and we know which guy's sternum won. Uh, absolutely brutal. Uh, um, yeah, Averno gone. We're down to Negro Casas and Santo. Oh, my God. And this is where this show, this match, <laughs> reaches another level. And, oh, my God, Negro Casas is incredible. I also, watching Negro Casas here, not like the heel antics, but the way he moves, the way he executes certain moves of precision... I had never thought of this before, but I see a lot of young Marafuji in the way Negro Casas moves here as a 45-year-old man. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, he, <laughs> that it, He's one of those guys that like uh, he started to get old and then the switch flipped and he just got real old real fast. But like here, you know, he's still uh, he still can go. And, and him and Santo are uh, are putting on a they're like look we've only got like a minute let's just go a hundred miles an hour and give it everything we've got it's like a modern like stardom high speed title match yeah. like it's watching starlight kid and azumi here but instead it's uh io del santo and uh and negro casas in 2005 just wanted to point out with casas yes you are correct he did like hit a wall in terms of athleticism but it happened so much later than almost yeah. every single one of his contemporaries. Yeah, like when you're like he, in your 50s or almost yes. 60. Yeah. But he was do, here at 45, he was at warp speed. And that would continue for years after this. Like, particularly given the style, the rings, like you talked about earlier, it is freakish that he was this good as deep in his career as he was. He was by far the best person on this show. Like, there was no one even close to him. Santo with a top rope dive to the floor. In the ring, Casas with a brutal running drop kick to the seated Santo. First, all right, so the finish comes when Santo and Casas do a double pin. Both their shoulders are down. There's controversy over who won. The best ring announcer, he says, we will have the ultimate fall. So we're going back. 
I'm always amused whenever they have these, like where particularly it's when it's a championship match or a trophy match, a tournament final of some sort, where you have a double pin or you have a double count. Like the only way <laughs> to settle this is for the match to continue, for it to go into overtime, have an extra fall. But it's always sold as like, what are they gonna do? <laughs> yeah. What could, what solution could there possibly be to this conundrum we all find ourselves in? We're gonna cut on this the Friday trophy night. in half. Yeah, you get <laughs> no exactly. No, you get the trophy. You get the base. No, this is what had to happen, and it does in fact restart. Casas immediately gets thrown into the ropes in violent fashion. This it's, is the gif. If you follow us on social media, the gif for this show is Negro Casas getting like leg swept, leg fir legs first into the top rope and bounding backward. When you watch it real time, it looks violent, him being thrown in here. On the replay, it's the safest thing you've ever seen. Which <laughs> is, you just described ideal professional wrestling. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Like, I watched it in real time and I screamed. And then and then they showed the replay and I'm like, ah, oh, well done. That guy's a pro. And <laughs> after he comes off the ropes here, Santo puts on the camel clutch and he gets the submission victory. Santo celebrates. He's got the trophy. And he goes and celebrates with all of the children of Mexico. <laughs> like a much. Von Eric in Dallas, this guy. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, Negro Casas uh, kind of teases like he's going to attack him, but they shake hands and embrace, uh, acknowledging how freaking great they both are, particularly Negro Casas, who I just I can't say enough good things about. And much like a, a Nick Bockwinkle, uh, as one example, it's a guy who – Saw a lot in the magazines about, read a lot about, maybe saw things here or there, but he's a guy that I think you and I would like to see much, much more of on this podcast, whether it be via uh, the randomizer or over on the bonus feed. If anyone wants to intentionalize us, uh, some Negro Casas, I don't think we would complain. Santo is pretty incredible, too, when you think about this man is the son of the most popular wrestler in Mexico history, right? Like El Santo is like the guy. Yeah, and beyond just a wrestler, like a cultural icon that's really hard to compare to any American wrestler in history when you think about all the movies and everything. Like the, only, the, only, way, the only sort of contemporary that I, I could, and grant you, was earlier, uh, meaning Santo was, but the only thing you could compare to in a different way because it wasn't movies uh, but is maybe Inoki in Japan. Yeah, so it's incredible to see a guy do his father's gimmick and be able to do it at a high level enough to where you're not the Kirkland's version of that. You're not just a, a, a watered-down, cheap imitation of the real thing. Uh, this guy was a bona fide top guy superstar, and and he like you never see that with a second generation superstar who's yeah you you it, it's almost impossible for someone well, to get to have that kind type of a, a role. Think about on this podcast all the guys we've seen that have not been able to do that to a dramatic degree. Think about. Eric Watts. I think about Greg Gagne is probably like, you know, the Greg Gagne, hundred percent. But yeah, you get it, it's it's crazy. David San Martino, another one. Like they have yep. all these guys that were the sons of whether they be regional or national icons that just didn't have it at all. No, and this would be all three of those guys put together in the popularity of Santo. Exactly, and, exactly. And, and he he did it. So it's always impressive to see uh, El Yeah, the pressure. Him. Imagine the pressure. And I guess to an extent, maybe you're, you're under a mask, so maybe that helps a little bit um, internally with the pressure. But still, think about the immense pressure of being the son of El Santo and being able to do what El Eo del Santo did for so long. It, it really is incredible. Our main event... Universo Dos Mil, Ultimo Guerrero, and Ray Bucanero. I love Los Guerreros del Infierno. Oh they, these two guys, Ultimo Guerrero and Ray Bucanero, were my favorites when I was watching CMLL. I was obsessed with Los Guerreros. 
Uh, they had an awesome handshake. I did the handshake with my roommate, Pat, all the time. They and, did the raising uh, the roof sort of thing. The whole deal. I love these guys. They were so great. They, uh, We see them coming out with their, they're partnering with Universal Dos Mil. And they, they come out to Queens. We will rock you. Like and, any good 80s wrestling show here in 2005, that is the theme song. And I'm all excited to watch their whole intro and everything, but they're immediately jumped on the ramp by their opponents. We get El Hio del Perro Aguayo, Hector Garza, and, ter and uh, Terrible. Terrible. They are Perros del Mall. Yes. Um, uh, we, we should mention a few things. First, you talked about El del Perro Aguayo, another one that was shockingly great considering how huge of a star Pero Aguayo was, you know, yeah. another, another one of those kind of define the odds type of deals. Um, the, uh, with, with Terrible, uh, people who watch new Japan may remember Terrible having a run several years back in the tag league in new Japan and being sort of a satellite member of, uh, LIJ for a period of time. I thought, he sucked as always. <laughs> I, uh, nobody sucks more than Universal Dos Mil. Uh, no, he was he's a, old and terrible. Um, he's, he's always one of those been guys old too that like I feel like if you weren't following Lucha all the time, you always heard the name, and so you had like an idea of what they were in your head. Like for me, El Kanek was another one of those guys yeah. that yeah. when I finally saw him, like oh that's that's what that is. Yeah, but wasn't super impressed by him. We, no, we did have he's always been bad. Like, I, <laughs> so, I don't know a time where he was good. Like, he, he was always bad. He was always like the heavyweight champ. And like, that meant zero because it wasn't the, the big title. In yeah, it was Mexico. a lighter weight promotion yeah. for the most part. There was never a like, so you're telling me he was old and bad here. And there was never a time when he was. No, he was old and bad good. six <laughs> years prior when I was watching him there. Yeah, no, the guy sucked. Uh, well, how was, about Hector Garza, a name yes. that I think would probably be the most familiar with, with American wrestling fans out of everyone in this match from his time as a young wrestler on WCW Monday Nitro. He and those awesome tornillos to the floor, uh, being a big guy that can move. Here he's got basically a buzz cut, and he is freaking gigantic, like Davy Boy Smith level he is huge. I was not not fully prepared for what he was going to look like here. Uh, we should mention also, this is Rudo versus Rudo. So we learn right at the start that the even more Rudo of the Rudo's teams is Pero Selva as they enter up the, uh, the Los Guerreros uh, entrance, as you said. Yeah, another, th uh, another way people might know Hector Garza, in addition to that, is that uh, his nephews work for WWE current day as of 2022. Umberto Carrillo and Angel Garza are nephews of Hector Garza. As we go to Primera Caída, our first fall, Peros del Mal are killing everyone. Yes. Uh, the camera missed it as, as they were watching Ray Bucanero and Terrible fighting on the outside. But there was a small package win out of nowhere after this yeah. ass kicking by Universo Dos Mil. What? You say missed it and like, because there's no bell that happens after these falls. So like... It just happens, and like we see refs raising arms, but there's a pile of bodies. The camera, again, for the live shot they picked of whatever five angles they had, the, the worst, least clear, most confusing shot of the action in the ring so that then we have to watch by like the third of the five replays we see in between falls, we understand what happened. But it's so much more pronounced here because like you said, this is a Perilstel Mall beatdown for this entire fall. And then we don't see what happens. The fall's over, and it's one to nothing, not Peril Somo. What the hell is going on until we see a replay? Yeah, we see, well, we see a replay, and uh, all that happened, zero offense. No moves were done. Uh, it was literally just a small package out of nowhere, and Universal Dos Mil got the pin. So first fall, kind of a shocker. Then we go to Segunda Caída. The second fall starts with more. Peros del Mall domination. <laughs> yes. The one guy I just mentioned I don't want to see in this match, Universo Dos Mil, is in the ring again, and I'm livid. I'm like, get out of here. Well, I guess if we have to see him, seeing him get beat down while his tag partners can eventually make the comeback, I'm here for, although him winning that first fall did not endear this match to me whatsoever. 
Yes, finally, we get some Los Guerreros. Ultimo Guerrero does a slingshot to Hector Garza, but holds on. He's holding on to his legs, so he just kind of ends up standing him up. And Ray Bucanero flips over the top, does like a blockbuster, sending Garza down, but down across the bent knees of Ultimo Guerrero. This was awesome. He's ho- Guerrero keeps holding him in that position, now laid out. As Bucanero goes to the top rope, it's a corkscrew senton. Awesome sequence. I love these two guys. They are this was so great. So spectacular. This was, from an offensive standpoint, by far the best thing we saw uh, on this show. Uh, it made me want to see so much more of them as a team. It made me question why no one has brought this sequence of moves back as a, uh, as a double team going forward. I also love how... After this, as Ultimo Guerrero is just ruling the ring as he's wont to do, he starts utilizing hair mares. I always love seeing in modern men's wrestling hair mares. Uh, these were mean and violent. I loved it. Everyone fights outside the ring. And then all of a sudden, there's like a vendor tray, like a concession vendor. Uh, they take his tray and they start hitting Ultimo Guerrero with it. They're holding Universo Dos Mil across a box in the middle of the ring. At first I thought it was the stairs, but yes, it is just a box. And then uh, Pero Aguayo comes off the top with the double foot stomp. There's random dudes that hit the ring, and they take off shirts to show they're in Peros Del Mall shirts. I don't know who this is or what's going on. Pero Aguayo grabs the microphone. He cuts a promo. Universo Dos Mil. Universo tries to fight back, but it's quickly overwhelmed. The official decision is Peros Del Mal were disqualified. Uh, but the beating continues. And the show ends at this point. It it was uh, chaos. It's uh, uh, Peros Del Mal was uh, a hot act. I was I felt robbed of not getting to see Los Guerreros del Infierno. So uh, so extra heat on Peros del Mal from, <laughs> from me. Uh, but watching Pero Guayo Jr., I'm like, what a tragedy that that yeah. guy passed away in 2015 at the age of 35. Yeah. In the ring, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, ab- yeah. absolutely. But he was right here. I mean, you oh. want to talk about like... Uh, he, you want to talk about a guy who like Roosh wishes he could be. Yes. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I I actually, like I thought from a performer standpoint, I don't, I thought Pero Aguayo senior sucked. And so (laughs) I remember being violently angry watching on worlds collide when he's like beating Conan and everything. And so I was predisposed to not like, uh, the next Pero until I saw him. I'm like, oh my God, this dude is incredible. Uh, you mentioned this beatdown. So the beatdown goes on. We go to commercial. We come back from commercial. We see like the, you know, the clips of what are, you know, who's going to be on next week. And then they go back to the ring and the beatdown is still happening. They rip the shirt off the referee. It this hilarious visual of this old kind of rotund referee with no shirt on, but he still has his IFB. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. earpiece to get you know, communications from the back that amused me greatly. Now, the other thing, just this beatdown, it was the most NWO 96 97 beatdown that I've seen from a heel group that came after that. Like, you see, a lot of times you try to do that and it doesn't come off that well. This felt like one of those early NWO chaotic beatdowns to end an episode of Nitro. And you know, Ultimo Guerrero and Ray Bucanero, these are these are. T- you know, these are top guys. That yes. They're beating down. Uh, and, they're and beating down single Lex Mill. Luger. They're not, they're not beating down, you know, uh, Johnny B. Bad or something. Yeah. So this was, uh, this was, the people were going absolutely bonkers for this. Uh, so the, the heat was great. Uh, and I'm sure it led to uh, uh, more great stuff and the continued push. But they were of, going bonkers for it. But it was, it was again in that NWO way where you had, yes, yeah, some people were booing, but you also had a lot of people, particularly a lot of guys in the crowd, cheering wildly for this Perilous Del Mall beatdown. So you could see they had something here more than just your typical 
heels that get booed sort of unit. Yeah, great stuff. So, uh, Adam, this is your one of your first times sitting down watching an entire uh, episode of CMLL. Uh, we what we didn't have here that's indicative of a normal show. We didn't have the backstage segments. We didn't have the skits. Right? There was no skits on this one. Instead, we had like kind of the production crew, yeah, uh, behind the scenes stuff instead. So you missed out on that. I think that would have put it over. That would have been your favorite. Thing. <laughs> uh, so you missed out on that. But otherwise, this is a pretty by the books uh, uh, type of a show here. Uh, best thing on the show for you. Without a doubt for me, it's Negro Casas. I just thought he was off the charts. Incredible, particularly that last minute of, of him and Eo Del Santo was one of my favorite things I've seen in quite a few uh, episodes of this podcast. Uh, one of my favorite things this season, for sure. Um, seeing Ultimo Guerrero do Ultimo Guerrero things was also great. Um, as far as the show itself, I really enjoyed it once. Like, like I said, it took me about halfway through the show for my wrestling brain, if I can use that phrase, to switch into lucha mode. You know, you're watching it through that prism of what, how you normally watch wrestling. You're like, oh, I don't know. What are they doing? What are they doing? And then it just sort of flips like, yeah, this is lucha. Just go with it. And then I had a great time. Um, but yeah, for me, I would say Negro Casas for sure uh, was the highlight of this show. Yeah, for me, I, uh, I, I'd i say, you know, that Santo Negro Casas uh, interaction was great. Um, I thought that uh, uh, the the dive over the people off the ramp was pretty, that, that was a uh, stellar moment for sure. From the uh, unidentified Bam Bam? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, for, uh, you know, I definitely, uh, although it was only a brief, glimpse the the nostalgia rush that i got from uh i it, it hit all of the uh, uh all the receptors in the brain here giving me more <laughs> uh los guerreros del infierno the ultimo guerrero ray bucanero in there so uh while it was brief it was it was uh, uh it was pretty pretty darn awesome and i didn't get to watch a lot of Ferro del mall i i saw the shirts i heard about it a, a lot but i didn't didn't see a lot of it uh so it was uh i thought that their their beatdown was incredibly effective yeah yeah no again it like it made me feel that beatdown made me feel like watching like i did watching nitro in 96 97 so that's that's definitely um a very good thing honorable mention to that one commercial break that built so <laughs> well to the hemorrhoids and hell commercial very um, true. that was that was incredible uh worst thing on the show for you oh man i don't know that's that's tough um nothing offensive on here so there's nothing no like... no again once you get your brain into lucha mode there really was nothing offensively bad um universo dos mil really doesn't do anything for me uh, so maybe that um i would say that or maybe the non-dive stuff in the opener like the dives are great otherwise it was just really kind of pointless um not a big Okamura guy, but he was fine. Yeah, I mean, there was nothing. The air horns for you? Yes, was, yes. Yeah. Though you nailed it. See, I've blocked them out of my mind. The <laughs> air horns in match one in Arena Coliseo, the acoustics, the way the uh, the crowd, meaning the air horns, was mic'd, it was intolerable. Um, but I think that's more on me than on them. So, yeah. Otherwise, really nothing I could complain about. Yeah, I'd say uh, for me, the uh... – you touched on Universal Dos Mill, way too much of him. Uh, and then uh, the uh, the the tournament there, the Group A versus Group B match uh, was so rushed that it was just finish, 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 finish. Yes. And I didn't get, I wanted to see some of these pairing off here. I want to see Averno with Volador Jr. I want to say... Yeah, we barely saw any of Volador, which really no. made me sad because he, on the Fantastic Mania shows for New Japan, is always one of my favorite guys. Yeah, love, you know, I want to see uh, a lot of these guys uh, in a longer match, and this was just finish, 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 finish. Uh, so um, that was the, that's probably the worst thing for me, but uh, redeemed by the finish, of course. Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. God, do I want to see more of... of Elio Del Santo and Negro Casas going at it one-on-one. -on -one. That whet my appetite, something fierce. 
And with that, we're going to call it a podcast. Adam mentioned you can request us to watch a show. That's because over on the Patreon site, that's how you can support the show over on patreon.com slash wrestling at random. There we put out a bonus episode every single week of additional content, a bonus episode. It's stuff that doesn't quite fit into the free feed that the randomizer chooses. But also we have a tier for patrons where you can choose a show for us to watch. So we've got a ton of awesome listener suggestions over there, uh, listener requests. Uh, we have an entire, we have a hundred episodes plus at this point in the back catalog over on the bonus feed. Those are shows you haven't heard. You you heard one in the free feed. We put the Memphis one in there. Oh, we also put an ECW one in the free feed. So you, there's a couple that you've heard here, but... Uh, there's 98 more over there. Plus, that 98% exclusive podcasts that you've never heard before. Uh, we're, we're basically at the point to where there's as many shows that you've never heard in the bonus feed as shows that you have heard in the free feed. Even if you've been with us since episode one of season one, you have an equal amount of shows just waiting for you in the bonus feed. Just five dollars unlocks the entire back catalog for you. It's it's it, it's a great deal. Now's the time to do it. It's a great uh, great Christmas present for your friends. Get in there and uh, uh, go ahead and and try it out. Fire it up for a month. Unlock all that stuff. Listen to some bonus content. And uh, it, it's you can pick and choose. And then if you want to stick around. A lot of people do keep that recurring uh, five bucks going and you continue to get new episodes every single week. And you've got you're you're traveling for the holidays. Nothing, nothing beats unlocking all that bonus content and having a ton of stuff to listen to while you're doing your travels or commute. It's uh, yeah. a lot of stuff there. It's evergreen yeah, content. It 100 percent is. And in essence, while we wouldn't recommend this and we don't think you'll do this because we think you'll hear these episodes and want to continue subscribing in theory. For $5, you could go and download every single one of our bonus feed episodes, load them up on your player of choice, and then have all that content with you for God knows how long before, until you get through it. We think you'll you'll do that and then still keep subscribing. But either way, you could get God, how many hours do you think? Because some of them have gone a little You probably got at least 100 hours of content over there, maybe more, least, just yeah. waiting for you. And so that's the best way to support the show. If you can't support the show financially in these times, we totally understand as well. Uh, wrestling fans know other wrestling fans, so you can spread the word about the show. Tell them about the podcast. Show them how to subscribe to the podcast. We're available on any podcatcher of choice. Get them in the free feed. Have them uh, start listening to this show. Uh, your word of mouth is another way to support the show. Show and them the YouTube channel, even. I was about to say, and uh, give us a subscription on the YouTube channel. That's right. We have a video version of this podcast. Uh, for the first few seasons, we were putting up uh, just audio versions up there. But starting in season four, we started putting a video version of this podcast. You can see Adam and I's smiling faces up <laughs> on uh, YouTube as, uh, as we do this. So... Uh, you can get the video version of the podcast via YouTube. Uh, and uh, every subscribe over there helps us as well. So even though you're subscribed to this, to this podcast on your podcatcher of choice, throw us a subscription on the YouTube also. Totally helps us work the algorithm so that other people can help uh, help them find the podcast. And I it's also like a we, great way to interact with the show. We need another shirt. We have the logo shirt. We need another shirt that has our logo and also says, work the algorithm <laughs> and then we've got uh our social media as well that's a if, if you can interact with the show via youtube comments we love those <laughs> as well as uh twitter and instagram at wrestle at random and uh facebook.com slash wrestling at random as well all places where you can uh interact with the show if you follow us on social media you will uh, we put out the gif of the show every single week, uh, previewing what episode we're going to review that Sunday and what's hitting your bonus feed every Thursday. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, those gifts don't miss out. If you like following this show, uh, you like listening to the show, you need to follow us on social media because you might just get hypnotized by seeing some of these things on an endless loop that we've created for you. I always go back to the, uh, from earlier this season, I think it was, the Dusty Rhodes arm wrestling <laughs> gif. One of my yes. proudest moments uh, with this podcast or in life in general, as sad as that may sound, is creating that gif. 
And with that, we're calling it a podcast. Adam, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, CMLL. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we will talk to you again next time.